අපි කාගෙත් කැමැත්ත සුවසේ ජීවත් වෙන්නයි කවුරුත් දන්න මෙල්ස්ටා සමූහයේ සවිම පදනම නිසා මෙල්ස්ටා හොස්පිටල් ස්වාගම මේ තරම් සුවිශේෂි ඉහළම ප්‍රමිති සහතික වලින් පිදුම් ලැබලා තියෙන්නේ සේවාවන්ගේ ගුණාත්මක බව නිසා පේනවනේ හරියට ජීවිතේ අලුතින් පටන් ගත්ත වගේ ඒ අපේ කම නිසායි තරංගකාරී අඩුම පිරිවැයකින් සේවාවන් ලබා දෙන්නේ හැමදාම අපේ සබැඳියාවේ වල් තනෝබයි මෙල්ස්ටා හොස්පිටල් ස්වාගම සුවවත් සවිමත් සබැඳියාවක් Established in 1954, Faro Sun Laboratories Limited's pharmaceutical manufacturing plant in Noshera Industrial Estate KPK was one of the first manufacturing facilities to be set up in the country with the aim of producing high-quality pharmaceutical products in Pakistan. Over the last 6 decades, the plant has undergone multiple expansions and is today one of the most modern production facilities in the country. The Faro Sons manufacturing facility is spread over 30 acres of land with a total annual capacity of over 900 million tablets and capsules and about 20 million syrups, sachets and other pharmaceutical formulations. Designed according to the international principles of pharmaceutical production, the Faro Sons Laboratories Noshera facility is fully CGMP compliant. People trust us. Thank you for putting your trust in Faro Sons. Good afternoon and welcome to the final symposium of today which is on a it's a topical discussion um about healthcare access to people with disabilities during covid-19 um i'm delighted um that we have an audience of both fellow academics as well as uh, people representing the disability rights movement um our parents as well as our students so a warm welcome on behalf of my department as well as the faculty now in interest of it being a very mixed audience a very diverse audience With your permission I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to set the agenda as well as give you a bit of a background. A quick um notice we will take some questions um at the end of the symposium. We have three speakers or three presentations. So do please send in your your thoughts, your reflections and your critical tough questions for our speakers so that we can generate uh, an exciting discussion. Now in terms of COVID-19 within the backdrop of the existential crisis which is COVID-19 in one sense it has brought us together because it has made us more equal and and that is because we've had a shared experience of covid-19 we have all been terrified together we have um been concerned together we've been angry together and certainly we have felt a, a, a lack of um control over our own healthcare with others making decisions for better or worse Now our colleagues in the disability rights movement tell us that this has been a incredibly tough time for them. Um in terms of limited access to healthcare information to um not knowing when lock the lockdowns are imposed um as well as in terms of access to online education. There has been little to no discussion or representation of persons with disabilities in any task force and very little if at all any consultation so for all healthcare professionals this has been a challenging time to decide on continuing services on the one hand and juxtapose with that our our desire to keep our clients safe what we know from the evidence so far for instance from the british medical journal this year in july that had an article on uh, people with learning disabilities we know that they are five times more likely to require hospitalization if they contract covid-19 and almost eight times likely to succumb to it so there's a very real desire to keep our clients safe so for speech and language therapists how do we continue services and not quote unquote abandon our clients which is a term coined by the american speech and hearing association but also 
um, adhere to the healthcare guidelines. So for speech therapists, how do we support speech reading or lip reading for a young child who is deaf or hard of hearing? How do we do an oromotor assessment with a little girl with Down syndrome who may be drooling? How do we facilitate hand-on-hand -hand how to use an alphabet chart or a communication chart or a communication app on an iPad for a stroke survivor? As well as all of our work in assessment and intervention to do with dysphagia that may involve laryngeal palpation, um, os um, cervical auscultation, and some instrumentation, for example, with a child with uh, cerebral palsy. So when it is an unprecedented time, I think it calls for unique care pathways and innovative practice, as well as an honest and deep reflection from a disability rights perspective of who gets access to our services and who gets left behind. And so to start us off on that critical reflection, I am so humbled and delighted and deeply honored to welcome Ms. Kamini Gadok, who M MBE, who is the CEO of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. Now, Kamini is no stranger to anybody who is a speech and language therapist worldwide, but in the interest of our diverse audience, I'd like to um, introduce her more formally. So, Kamini Gadok, MBE, has been Chief Executive of the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, uh, RCSLT, in the UK since 2000. The RCSLT provides leadership for the speech and language therapy profession in the UK and supports involve, uh, improvements to services for people with speech language communication and swallowing difficulties. As a former speech and language therapist herself, Ms. Gerrach had direct patient care responsibilities for about 14 years and has experienced working with a range of client groups that includes children, older people, people with learning difficulties across all ages in hospitals, community health centers, special schools, as well as mainstream schools. Now, before taking the helm at, the, at RCSLT, Ms. Gerrach worked for the Department of Health, where she founded the Race Equality Unit uh, and uh, took on a range of uh, roles at, in the National Health Service. She received an MBE in June 2009 for services to the allied health professions. Driven by Ms. Gaddock's vision for speech and language therapy and her commitment to partnership, to partnership working, the RCSLT has undergone a step change in its external reputation, its profile and influence under her leadership. Her career highlights include leading a coalition of 25 professional organizations in a campaign to better protect healthcare workers against COVID-19 and launching a UK-wide communication access initiative that is transforming how businesses and organizations support people with communication needs. So over to you, Carmini. Hello, thank you so much for asking me to speak at your conference about service provision guidelines and recommendations for speech and language therapists during COVID-19. So my name is Kamini Gadhok and I'm Chief Executive at the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists in the UK. It was really interesting putting this presentation together because it made me really think about what had happened since last March, where I think whilst we were beginning to understand that something was happening with the pandemic in February, we weren't aware of the impact of that until last March. At that time, there were concerns about the fact that we were actually going through a significantly challenging period. And uh, we had members who were reaching out to us via Twitter because they were really concerned about transmission and how the virus, which was unknown at that time and still we're obviously still learning about it, uh, was going to impact on their health and well-being, particularly for those members who um, undertake 
eating, drinking and swallowing assessments or work with patients with dysphagia and may also be undertaking procedures that could generate um, aerosol, so aerosol generating procedures or AGPs as they're known. And when they reached out, we tried to think about what we could do to support them. Um, of course, we also didn't really understand enough at that time to know what our response needed to be. However, as we went into the initial lockdown last March, we had to work really quickly to think about new ways of working and thinking of how to respond to the needs of our members. And obviously, as a result of supporting them, looking at what that would mean for the service users they worked with. So we initiated daily stand-ups with staff to, to really set up remote working, to think about how we could work together and with our members as we went forward. So some of the immediate action was really to, to establish new ways of communication, both, you know, one way to provide information. So, for example, through weekly newsletters to members so that when we know, knew what was happening, we could communicate to them. And also two ways. So we set up a COVID-19 advisory group, which is UK wide and was very much set up based on the, the issues that were being raised by members across the UK. And it still is running now. We, we meet less frequently, but at the time we were working to meet with them on a weekly basis. Uh, and as I said before, this was really so that we heard from our members on the ground what was actually happening for them and what they were picking up so that we could then look at what it meant for us to work with them to look at guidance that needs to be developed. And one of the big key areas of um, guidance was around um, the personal protective equipment or PPE. So what we've done over time is having developed that guidance last year, we've, re we've changed it and iterated it to respond to the changing circumstances. So to start with that guidance, totally focused on just the services that were still open. So in the UK, what happened was that many services for patients were stopped. Um, so because of hospital numbers, patients who would normally have been seen in outpatients were no longer attending clinics. So the focus of our guidance was very much for those speech therapists who were still seeing patients, mostly in a hospital acute care setting. Um, and that has changed over time. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So there was a really big piece of work around how, how we coordinated guidance with our members. We also work with members to, to help them to put together reports. For example, one of the first reports that was published last April and is on the website was around um, AGPs and the risk of undertaking AGPs in terms of um, the virus and how it could be trans transmitted. And that continues to be cited by other professional bodies as, a, as an exemplar actually of how our profession really um, worked very quickly to respond to some of the challenges last year. The other area that was really important very quickly was looking at data collection. As a new virus, as something that we didn't really know and understand, we felt very, very, uh, what was very important coming from our members was knowing how many patients were coming in with COVID-19, what their clinical needs were and how these were being managed so that we had a better picture and we could start gathering that information to help inform uh, and share um, ways of working and treatment which I'm going to come on to. So what was really interesting as we went into April, uh, not that long after we went through lockdown, was that we had um, the opportunity to share examples of what the learning was. So as I said, one thing was around data collection. The other one was actually, what, what are we doing with these patients in critical care? What's the difference uh, in terms of the type of need that they have? And it was very clear, and I think you're all very aware that COVID has significant impact, particularly for those patients who end up in intensive care units. Um, and so we did run a webinar, uh, we put it together very quickly, I think it was put together in about a week in terms of content, which was very fast paced for us, like most of the things at that time we kept talking about working at pace. Uh, it was really important that we shared that learning very quickly and the webinar is still on the website and we opened it up for anybody who wanted to sign in. I think it was one of the webinars that we had over about a thousand people coming to listen to the learning. So it just shows how important it was at that time. 
We also did a lot of work with government. And again, this was across the UK. I'm sure you're uh, aware that uh, many countries were looking to see what China was doing to respond to the huge surge in demand for intensive care units, for hospital beds, for patients who had contracted COVID. And so in, in, um, in the UK, Nightingale hospitals were being set up. So buildings were being repurposed as almost field hospitals. And we were asked to, again, very quickly come up with what the role of speech language therapists would be, how the workforce would be um, engaged in, in supporting those patients in those particular circumstances. Of course, the reality was that there weren't enough speech therapists to, who could be deployed into Nightingales. There were some, but I think the workforce generally uh, was very low in terms of number to, for, for redeployment. However, again, we learned a lot through the work that was done. And it was really good because it helped us to shine a light when working with government on how speech and language therapists could really add value to support patients who had contracted COVID-19. The other things that we had to work very quickly on was um, working with universities around student training and the development and support for students. Obviously, a huge impact on students, both in terms of their on-site learning and their ability to go on physical placements where uh, clinics had, as I said before, might have been stopped and stalled. And we worked to find new solutions for that. The regulator in the UK is the HCPC and they were very keen, well the government was very keen and we were very keen to support this, was to start a temporary register. So this was about bringing people back into the profession who might have recently um, retired and could again add value uh, as part of the workforce that was needed. So those were just some of the uh, things that we did working with government across the UK. In terms of trying to influence into the system. So I talked about how it was really important early on to highlight the unique contribution of speech language therapy. We were also concerned, as I said earlier, about the impact of uh, services being closed and the reality of that for our service users. So we did do a number of surveys that we could use to inform our lobbying and influencing at that time, um, we had a lot of members who had also been redeployed out of, say, children's services to work in hospital settings. Some of them were not actually using their skills to the best effect. And that was really, really bad because it was bad for morale and it was not a good use of their time and expertise. So what this slide highlights is the impact of all the, the outcome sorry of the survey that we conducted last August to September which shows the impact on service users who hadn't received intervention and the and also what some of the barriers were for service users in trying to access services so um, I'm going to come back to telehealth but as we are probably aware you know one of the the, the new routes to 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 deliver a service was the use of telehealth and telecare. And actually we found from both our membership anecdotally and then through the survey that there were a number of service users who couldn't access telehealth either because of digital poverty or low levels of digital literacy. But there were, you know, there were real issues around access as a result. I just wanted to highlight some of the work that we did um, in terms of the guidance that was produced certainly at last year, and some of it is going to have to be refreshed for this year, because as we know, we're now going into the winter months in, in the UK, and the number of people with COVID-19 is again on the increase. So uh, this just shows that we that the sort of areas that we worked on, I've already mentioned uh, guidance on the use of PPE and reducing the risk of transmission, which was one of the biggest areas of concern. Uh, we also did a lot of work to um, influence government. We're still waiting for the outcome of this on the use of transparent face masks. Now, there was a bit of a worry at one time that um, there was a lot of new uh, face, there were a lot of new face, face masks on the market that were transparent, but actually we were aware that they hadn't actually passed any safety tests. So this was very much about getting government to take responsibility for this, which they're still doing. So that's good. Again, more um, information about what we did working at PACE in produ producing guidance. One of the big concerns that our members had, as did other professional bodies, was really 
uh, around some of the procedures that we were using and what was still safe to um, undertake, particularly if um, healthcare workers couldn't access what's called FFP3, so the full respirators that really um, provide the ultimate protection for the virus. So if you're if you're faced in a situation that you can't get the right PP or RP as it's known, then what do you do? And also, if you are undertaking these procedures, what sort of RP or PP is important for you to have? So this is just, again, showing what we did at that time to work with our members to identify some guidance about how to undertake these sorts of procedures. We also worked with other professional bodies to really think about how, um, uh, particularly in this case, this was patients who had uh, laryngectomy, what was needed to be done to support them. We wrote to government as well because we were concerned that people who'd had a laryngectomy were not on the list of patients who should be shielding and many had already been reaching out to their speech therapists worrying about the risk for them. So uh, we did work with other professional associations as well as working on other types of guidance around airway disorders uh, in the context of COVID-19. As time went on last year, the NHS in England um, wanted to build an online website, uh, sorry, an online portal to support those patients who'd had COVID because we hadn't at that time and still haven't really worked through in detail the rehabilitation pathway for patients who've had COVID-19. But uh, we were very keen to be involved and we have now, as part of this site, we've got a section around speech and language therapy and the role of speech therapists for patients who might be recovering and not sure where they need to go if they are still struggling with um, their recovery. I mentioned earlier some of the guidance that we've done and the regular updates. This is just an example of some of the things that we, we updated earlier this year, just to um, make sure that we were keeping on top of and in line with changes as they were happening, both in terms of service delivery and what we knew about the virus itself, as well as access to the appropriate PPE and what's called RPE, which is respiratory protective equipment. Another example of how we provide updates through the website, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but we were really keen for speech therapists to share practice. And some of that was by uploading case studies of how speech therapists were responding to COVID-19 and developing professional networks and providing a, a, an opportunity, an online opportunity for people to share resources, which was really important at that time too. And still is, if I'm, if I'm honest, it's, it's not stopped more examples of case studies um, and sharing best practice and the statement on redeployment, which I've just mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation that as we're going into the winter months, we are aware that we probably need to refresh the statement because we understand that the risk of re redeployment are now coming up again, which is a real shame. So it's something that we need to do. So as we've gone through the year, we've been working with members to share new ways of working. So thinking about some of the positive learning that's come from the pandemic. Um, as you might be aware, COVID-19 has really accelerated the use of digital health and digital care. I mentioned earlier that we're very aware that this isn't the best method of delivering a service. We know that for all patients, but for some, this was very transformative and it did support many service users to be able to continue to access speech therapy and you know we are looking and encouraging the membership to continue to share their learning on how it supported um, them to meet the needs of their service users. We are also asking members to collect data on outcomes in using telehealth because it is a newer method of service delivery. And more recently at our conference, uh, which was only um, in, at the beginning of this month in October, uh, we also had an opportunity for members to share their learning about COVID-19, what they did in terms of um, resetting up services and planning, uh, as you can see from this slide, that's just one example of what happened at the conference. We were very aware that many of our members had really worked over and above their day job during the COVID-19, um, the start of the COVID-19 pandemic last year, 
And um, what was really good to see was that government had decided that some of the Queen's honours could be specifically for healthcare workers who'd contributed considerably in the context of the pandemic. And we were absolutely thrilled that three of our members were successful in getting a Queen's honour. One received an OBE and two of them received MBE. So absolutely thrilled that they were actually recognised for that work that they've been doing. So where are we now? Well, we've still got an ongoing campaign with government and um, the public health um, or the, inf the, the, the public health agency as it was. It's now transformed into another government agency, uh, but it's Public Health England at the time who, who've been producing guidance on the use of PPE and RP if you are in the healthcare system. Uh, our concern is, is that the guidance doesn't reflect the fact that COVID-19 is airborne. Um, we are still working together to try and campaign on this as our voices have so far been unheard. And that includes the RCSLT and myself actually taking a lead in coordinating a coalition of over 18 professional bodies, unions, and individual experts who've been helping us with the campaign. We're also working really, really closely with the British Medical Association and the Royal College of Nursing because we all actually have the same concerns. So it's a bit unprecedented, this situation where all the professional bodies are all saying the same thing, but for some reason, government is not listening. So um, just to say this is something that we're going to be obviously working on as we go forward, particularly as numbers are now going up again, it's becoming a bigger issue. So I just talked about the fact that transmission rates are increasing. We're in a situation where we have an exhausted healthcare workforce. We also have huge shortages of clinicians and we're working with government looking at the workforce. How do we try and accelerate people within the speech and language therapy workforce? So that includes uh, apprentices, that includes support workers, as well as looking for international recruitment where we can, of course, because that has been a real challenge. Um, we have huge waiting lists and waiting times, particularly for services that were stopped or stored. And we have been working to lobby government around how particularly the, for example, the needs of children are not ignored this time round. As I mentioned last year, there were many speech language therapists working with children who were redeployed and children's services on the whole were really um, not seen as being that important, but the impact has been huge on our children and young people. So it's really important that we think about the learning from that and um, that we continue to lobby, which is what we're going to be doing. I've mentioned about the risks of redeployment and the fact that we are going to have to reissue some of our previous statements. And I think the big learning, um, at the beginning of the pandemic last year, uh, we thought we were running a marathon and it was working at pace all the time, full on. And, you know, which has probably led to some of that exhaustion as well that, you know, members thought that if they if we all work really hard and really closely together, we would get through it. But unfortunately, it being a virus as it is, uh, we know that there are variants of concern and that um, whilst we have the vaccination rollout, which is been going really well, we still have these transmission rates that are increasing. So all the, the ways of reducing risk in the system are things that we're really looking at. And, uh, you know, it's something that we are working on together is how do we come up with a risk assessment framework for um, the NHS uh, so that we can help support our healthcare workers to make sure that they get the right level of RP and PPE, because we're still hearing that there are uh, the number of people working in the NHS who are getting COVID-19 and have also been double vaccinated is increasing. So it is a real concern for everybody. However, I don't want to forget or not highlight the positives. So I've talked about telehealth and working differently. In fact, some of the work that happened during the pandemic brought our members closer to families and to their service users because they had, had to adopt a new way of working. So there's some real positives. And I think the other big things are around developing great collaborative working. We've been really lucky that we have worked and built such great relationships with professional associations that actually we haven't worked with before, uh, including the, I mentioned the BMA and the RCN. And it's been really constructive to do that. 
And from our members' point of view, I think what they're really pleased to hear and to see is the fact that they that their uh, skills have been recognised, that the value that they add uh, within uh, the population of people who've had COVID-19 is now being recognised more and more. And in fact, we had a lot of media coverage on the role of speech and language therapists, which has really helped to boost the profile. So that's where we are now. And I think we have a lot more to do as we go forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kami, for so eloquently and cogently, very, very clearly put, sharing with us um, the journey that RCSLT has, has done and, and the campaigns you've tirelessly um, continued. Um, I was really struck by the work RCSLT has put in to keeping fellow speech and language therapists at, and on the ground level safe in the UK, as well as your endeavors to ensure that services to persons with disabilities, with communication and swallowing difficulties continues. And really struck by the coalition that you put together and, and the research that you pull together and the policy papers to be able to speak truth to power even when, um, that, even when power doesn't always listen to, to our voices. So there's much to learn from, um, from your journey. So thank you, Kamini. And so from that policy perspective, we are going to move to a ground level realities of speech and language therapies and to a global north perspective. And I'm delighted that Dr. Anna Miles, uh, who is senior lecturer at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, is to join us next. Just a, a brief introduction to uh, Dr. Miles, if I may, please. So Dr. Anna Miles is a practicing speech and language therapist with over 20 years of experience working in the acute and community setting. She is a senior lecturer, as I said, at the University of Auckland and is a researcher, a lecturer and clinician in the area of voice and swallowing disorders. So she wears many hats. Dr. Miles runs a hospital-based student teaching clinic as well as an outpatient voice and swallowing rehabilitation clinic. The Swallowing Research Lab Laboratory in the Center of Brain Research at the University of Auckland, led by Dr. Miles, strives to improve the lives of people living with swallowing difficulties through improved assessment, treatment, and medical education. The lab hopes to introduce on, on, um, good practices and to reduce risks of pneumonia and death associated with swallowing difficulties, as well as to improve the quality of life of people living with swallowing difficulties. Now, Dr. Miles is the New Zealand Speech and Language Therapist Association's clinical expert in adult dysphagia and COVID-19, and is co-chair of the Dys uh, Dysphagia Research Society COVID Task Force in 2020. We are so delighted that you can join us to share with us your expertise in service delivery for adults, as well as per perhaps some reflections on children as well, on, uh, in terms of dysphagia management. Over to you, Dr. Miles. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to present at the 30th anniversary of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Kelania. I had the great privilege of visiting the university and traveling around Sri Lanka in December 2018 before the pandemic. It's a beautiful and history-filled country with wonderful people and I look forward to visiting again once we're able to travel once more. My name is Dr. Anna Miles. I'm a speech therapist, um, a researcher, a lecturer, an academic. Um, after 13 years of clinical practice, primarily in acute 
neurology, neurosurgery and trauma, I had the opportunity to get involved in a research project and accidentally got hooked on research. I moved to the University of Auckland as a clinical tutor during my PhD um, and soon um, created and, and applied successfully for a lectureship in dysphagia. Since then, I've created a path through the university with a thriving university research laboratory uh, where we've had two of your university lecturers uh, wonderfully to join us to con complete their PhDs. Um, I teach at master's level dysphagia and voice and coordinate the postgraduate speech science um, research. The university lab is full of all of the, the technology that allows us to research wonderfully in the field of dysphagia, but we also work um, heavily with the clinicians in the field. Um, and I still run a, a hospital clinic with students and run a private outpatient clinic for head and neck cancer, voice, chronic cough and dysphagia. My interest and work in the COVID-19 response came from my position as Vice President and Professional Standards for the New Zealand Speech Language Therapists Association, where I needed to support our profession um, and their response to COVID-19. I was then asked to co-chair the Dysphagia Research Society's COVID-19 Task Force, and this has led to a number of publications and task force activities over the last two years. In, no in November 2020, I was asked, asked to bring together a group of international experts to write a paper for the Dysphagia Journal on dysphagia and COVID-19. We hope this paper will be published very soon. It's been through um, a round of um, revisions. This incredible team of researchers and clinicians across the globe um, were um, given the honor to present at the World Dysphagia Congress earlier in the year. Um, and I'm going to present some of the work that we presented there with a little extra um, since, since August that we've um, learned more about. And I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest to announce. This international expert panel was tasked to provide a critical review of the impact of the pandemic on speech pathologists and on patients with dysphagia. We found 15 published papers uh, with a combined uh, 1,112 patients um, reporting dysphagia after COVID-19. And we added to this our own unpublished primary data from nine international sites. We also report on survey data from over 2000 speech pathologists, physicians and dentists discussing the impact of COVID-19 on their practices. It's an impossible topic to try and cover in 20 minutes. We've all um, worked very hard for two years in this new area but um, I will try and summarize some of the interesting lessons learned so far. As we're all very, very aware, uh, coronavirus 2019, COVID-19 is a highly infectious viral disease. And since December, 2019, mutant variants of the disease have, the virus have led to repeated outbreaks around the world with no real sign of the pandemic easing at the time of uh, this presentation, despite the incredible work of scientists to speedily uh, produce um, a vaccine or a number of vaccines to support disease control. When I presented at the World Dysphagia Congress in August, you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen, we were sitting at 4 million deaths worldwide recorded. And now here we are in October and we're reaching 5 million recorded deaths with very few countries around the world spared of the virus and its impact. Kamini, I'm quite sure, has provided a, a thorough 
description of the incredible work of RCSLT in the UK and the UK's response to COVID-19. RCSLT really have been leaders in this area and have supported many of us through their practices. Like the UK, surveys with speech pathologists, associations and dysphagia societies around the world have shown similar trends. The definition of aerosol generating procedures and its associated um, infection control guidance in dysphagia management has been debated. And with this, we've moved from a complete banning of endoscopy and flexible endos um, evaluation, endoscopic evaluation of swallowing to a gradual working out of how to continue to treat patients during the pandemic safely. Um, much of this work has been done by Royal College of Speech Language Therapists in the UK and their members. It's highly likely that during that period without endoscopy, that many of our patients with dysphagia with COVID and without COVID have received suboptimal dysphagia management throughout the pandemic. And knowledge now of how important endoscopy is to determine laryngeal features of COVID-19 means that patients in the early waves were potentially managed in a less effective way. Uh, the impact of this on patients with chronic diseases, um, we still don't know. As you can see in these statistics around the world, staff sickness, staff redeployment has been high um, and limitations on work practices, especially in community settings, has continued to significantly impact referral numbers inpatient assessments and therapies and waiting list management. And the private sector has perhaps been even more significantly impacted in terms of employment, as well as access to communities. Well-being of health professionals is a huge concern moving forward. And I'm quite sure Kamini has, men has mentioned the UK statistics that her team has contributed to in this area. Low morale, well-being issues rose in the UK um, between March and September last year, um, with optimism and burnout considerable concerns to, to the society. Similar findings have just been highlighted in a, a published well-being survey across Ireland with 38% of the speech therapists screened as positive for depression, 36 for anxiety, and 49 for stress. This is a huge problem because we're not coming to the end of the pandemic for these um, poor clinicians who are, are managing the, the disease. Now, many countries have reinstituted non-COVID-19 elective and outpatient services, and we're trying to remove, return to um, a level of normality while containing the disease. But with this, managing our increasing wait lists um, and backlogs logs that occurred in 2020, and the continuing high numbers of COVID-19 patients on top of this um, already increased caseload um, is a huge challenge for speech therapists worldwide. There is, of course, been a disruption to the provision of training and supervision for our students and our junior staff. And this continues to be a problem that we're having to manage as we move forward in ensuring that our newest recruits remain um, able and capable um, in the workplace in perhaps an even more challenging workplace than they would normally have to manage. Through our literature review, we created a, a list of red flags for dysphagia risk after COVID-19 um, that can be used to triage and to support risk assessments and referral to speech therapy. These all represent increased risk for poor outcome in dysphagia and dysphonia after COVID-19 
um, or increased risk of increased impact of function or occupation. There are clear medical and hospitalization risks for dysphagia and dysphonia after COVID-19. Comorbidities of COVID-19 make likelihood of pre-existing dysphagia greater, as do many of the underlying conditions that predispose a patient to more severe COVID-19 disease. Pre-existing neurological conditions are a major red flag and this is complicated by the potential neurological symptoms that COVID-19 itself can cause. Increased BMI means increased risk of reflux related laryngeal injury and potential for more complex and prolonged tracheween impacting on function. Increased age comes with higher likelihood of prolonged hospitalization and dysphagia and with a higher likelihood of to swallow decompensation, pre-morbid dysphagia, uh, multiple comorbidities and frailty. Pre-morbid respiratory disease should be considered. There's a known relationship between COPD and aspiration pneumonia and the desynchrony of respiration and swallowing in COVID-19 shouldn't be underestimated. COVID comes with increased ICU stays compared to other ICU populations. And this comes with immobility, muscle loss, deconditioning, sepsis, neuro, uh, polyneuropathy, uh, malnutrition, and risk of disuse atrophy, all of which impact on your risk of dysphagia. The increased ICU stays are definitely quite clearly coming with increased length of intubation. And as we know, intubation length um, is strongly predictive of laryngeal injury and dysphagia in um, the populations that we treat. Um, and those laryngeal in injuries are becoming more and more clear as we um, move through the pandemic and more publications are being um, uh, sent out for us to, to review. There are reports of long-term fatigue for many, and in those with dysphonia or dysphagia, this may have significant functional implications on recovery. And I don't think we can underestimate the impact of taste, smell, anxiety and depression on um, functional outcomes for dysphagia and dysphonia for our patients. Let's take a look at the laryngeal pathology in a little bit more detail. The longer intubation times, including need for tracheostomy are associated with COVID-19 and they increase the risk of laryngeal injury, including vocal fold par paralysis, edema, granulation, and stenosis. In the acute setting, intubation-related laryngeal injury may manifest as poor secretion management, poor cough, impaired swallowing and airway protection, and hoarse voice. However, most cohort studies so far are suggesting that many of these patients with dysphagia after COVID-19 will recover functional swallowing whilst in hospital, with the majority of patients referred to speech therapy regaining near normal swallow function prior to hospital discharge, irregardless of their intubation duration and tracheostomy status. But with that in mind, we must remember how long their hospital stays are, and that perhaps some of this is that they're just spending so long in hospital, they're recovering during that hospital stay. In these pictures, you'll see patients with COVID-19 following ICU intubation. Um, in case A, we have a posterior glottal granulation tissue. Um, on the right, an edema um, of the vocal cords and hyperfunction of the left false vocal fold. In case two, we have an inability to ad abduct the vocal cords due to a posterior Glottal, glottic stenosis. 
In case C, this 55 year old male was tracheostomized and ventilated with a cuff up and a passimure valve on and previously intubated for four weeks. He's had two previous fees um, and kept an elbow mouth. And on this third fees, you can still see the posterior subglottic granulation tissue, um, more on the left than the right. Plenty of edema still um, um, in the vocal cords and the interarotenoid um, space. He was recommended to start on a um, thick, slightly thick fluid diet and minced and moist um, textures and um, had some effortful swallow rehabilitation as well as PPI. In case D, you'll see posterior glottic stenos stenosis. Um, and this patient unfortunately um, was prescribed long-term tracheostomy uh, with no real hope of um, a decannulation. In case E, we have a 35 year old, six weeks in ICU, four weeks with ETT and now tracheostomy um, with ventilation, with a cuff down and a passimure valve for the time uh, for all oral intake. At the time of the fees, there was still plenty of swelling in the laryngeal vestibule and the vocal cords um, with the dermatous vocal cords and cystic lesions seen. Luckily, this patient at this point was able to return to a thin fluid regular um, food diet with passing your valve on for oral intake and PPI and was successfully extubated deca and decannul decannulated. And in case F, you'll see diffuse laryngeal um, edema and excessive secretions, really common in early stage um, ICU admissions and really prohibitive of airway protection and, and swallow function, um, as well as obviously um, much laryngeal vocal rehabilitation. We get a slightly different perspective when we look at the non-hospitalized patient caseload um, and the uh, community caseload. In our extracted primary outpatient data from, um, from across the UK, we found that the non-hospitalized patients were mostly female with a high proportion of muscle tension dysphonia and associated breathing pattern disorders as well as globus, cough, and dysphagia. Outpatient ENT clinics are seeing new onset vocal cord palsies, even in those um, who have not been intubated or hospitalized, um, similar to those of uh, vir viral uh, vagal nerve um, injuries. Patients who had previous respiratory and laryngeal symptoms are most vulnerable to post-COVID deterioration. And those patients of ours who um, are already on our caseload and contract COVID-19, we must be super careful with, particularly with um, risks of laryngeal hypersensitivity, chronic cough and breathing disorders. Breathing difficulties, Ongoing chronic cough, globus and pain are common long-term symptoms after COVID-19 and are of particular interest to speech therapists um, as we have the skills of upper airway disorders um, to manage these patients in the community setting. Importantly, um, a number of our experts reported uh, new subglottic stenosis and airway problems in outpatient follow-up uh, that required surgical interventions and even in some cases emergency surgery, um, suggesting that speech therapists should be really careful in their outpatient clinics to look out for patients with more complicated airway complications that, that occur later on in their recovery as edema and other symptoms um, resolve. And we should certainly be looking out for um, increased work of breathing and strider and comments from our patients 
and having a low threshold for um, referral to ENT. Long COVID is certainly an interesting concept for us and something we need to work really hard to, um, to support patients with. There's emerging evidence um, of ongoing symptoms long, long after COVID uh, recovery, including breathlessness, cough, fatigue, chronic, um, cognitive impairment and headache. But interesting, also 30% um, of patients appear to be reporting changes in voice, lump in the throat and swallowing difficulties. And alongside taste, smell and gastro issues, um, it's really important that speech therapists are looking out for these problems and their significant impact on those already susceptible to dysphagia and dysphonia, as well as um, our outpatient populations in terms of well-being, health and employability. So in summary, some of the lessons we've learned, COVID has a significant impact on speech therapists, on their work practices, the skills they've had to learn and their well-being. And patients with COVID who require ICU stays are distinct from other ICU populations with longer ICU stays and more common laryngeal injuries. However, they are looking promising for returning to oral intake with rehabilitation and support. The laryngeal injuries make the need for endoscopy in the acute setting and in outpatient clinics critical for a speech therapist's ability to work with this population. Some patients clearly do need more long-term rehab and we have very little data to support us in this area as yet. Um, and we should certainly be looking out for the long COVID implications to our outpatient clinics in terms of dysphagia, dysphonia and hypersensitive larynx syndromes. There's still a lot we don't know. We're going to need researchers to support health services as they manage the well-being and mental health of patients, communities and health professionals. And we continue to need innovation in PPE. PPE is clearly now here to stay and we need to maximize safety, convenience, as well as the environmental and economic implications of increased PPE use. We need to continue to unravel the pathophysiology of dysphagia in COVID um, and therefore be able to explore rehabilitation um, and optimal uh, treatment approaches to maximize outcomes for our patients. We don't yet know the full impact of vaccination um, on severity of illness um, and those patterns are just starting to impact now. But um, I think we can still guarantee that long COVID will be something we need to consider and we can still guarantee that our most vulnerable in aged care and vulnerable populations will continue to need speech language therapy input long term. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to the rest of the um, conference. Thank you very much Dr. Miles for such an incredibly informative presentation pulling uh, aspects of your own research and collaborative research to inform us of the changing symptoms or landscape of uh, dysphagia in COVID-19, which is something that our clinicians at the ground level working in the hospital setting have been telling us. So I think they would have found it in incredibly useful um, to compare some of what they're finding here in Sri Lanka with what you are also finding in New Zealand. Um, thank you also for sharing with us some of the practices and information that you've gathered from across the world, including from the UK and from South Africa, as well as um, just highlighting the need to keep ourselves safe in terms of our psychosocial well-being. So thank you very much, Dr. Miles. So from um, a policy perspective, to the ground level realities um, in the global north, um, to now to the global south, uh, closer to home here in Sri Lanka. 
and I'm delighted to um, invite my colleagues from the Department of Disability Studies as well as the IIT Center um, to present on some of their journey as clinicians offering services during this time of COVID. Um, and as is the spirit of the work that we undertake, which is multidisciplinary, our presentation will also reflect our work uh, in collaboration. So the presentation is from Professor Saman Mali Sumanasena, Dr. Isuru Dharmasena, Dr. Tilini Lokubala Surya, together with contributions from Ms. Bhagya Devagiri, uh, Ms. Tanuja Jinadasa, as well as Mr. Amila Dilshan, and from Ms. Uh, Asha Nenum. So over to you, uh, Isru. Um, thank you, Madam. Um, good afternoon to all of you who are joining us uh, via live, um, via Zoom and live. Um, in this presentation, um, we are going to share our lived experience as clinicians uh, on service delivery for children with disabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic in Sri Lanka. In this session, we have lined up a few presentations targeting specific clinics um, representing the multidisciplinary model. We present empirical and preliminary evidence of the research and uh, clinical collaborations of the academic staff of the Department of Disability Studies, along with our colleagues at IIT Center. Due to the logistic matters, we have recorded the presentations of other speakers, um, and I'll give you a little bit of a background information before we start. So as we have been um, talking um, since the beginning of the symposium, so we are all experiencing the challenges of COVID-19 and it's far from brain over. And it was declared a pandemic uh, in March 2020. Since then, children and adults with disabilities were considered a more vulnerable group due to the var various complications they have. However, they still need to access services as they required to improve the quality of life during the pandemic period. Therefore, World Health Organization declared that service provision for people with disabilities should be continued as required during the pandemic, but with appropriate safety measures in place. At the early phases of COVID-19, Sri Lanka has imposed very strict curfew-like lockdown which had a huge negative impact on the healthcare services provided for children and adults with disabilities. According to the theory of disruptive innovation, sudden disruptions to the well-established practices and protocols may lead to innovation as well as unintended consequences, which can either be negative or positive. And we have been witnessing this in Sri Lanka and across the world since the beginning of the pandemic. Here uh, in this presentation, we are showcasing our clinical and research experience that we gathered by providing services at the IIT Center during the pandemic. Let me uh, give you a brief uh, info about IIT. IIT is the National Center for Children with Disabilities and is a hub for undergraduate and postgraduate healthcare trainees. By the time the COVID-19 hit Sri Lanka, IIT had over 4,000 um, children with disabilities who registered and um, who were receiving healthcare, educational and social services at IIT. And the clinicians had to took, uh, look at innovating synchronous and asynchronous modes of uh, service delivery to continue uh, their uh, care for children with disabilities at IIT. Now let's hear from Professor Saman Mali Sumanasena, the lead clinician and um, consultant pediatrician at IIT Center on establishing telehealth practices. Good afternoon. I will be briefing how we established telehealth services at the IIT Center to combat the global pandemic.
In March 2020, Sri Lanka announced the first lockdown and it went on for nearly two months with extreme restrictions. Subsequently, we had several lockdowns and several restrictions, especially in the Gampa district. There was a huge impact on the services, especially because acute health conditions took precedence over long-term conditions, including rehabilitation services and providing developmental care for children at risk. There was a massive impact on the families because they were they had to ensure that their children were safe from the COVID-19. However, they had to manage these children with multiple social, behavioral, and physical challenges at home. They could not access schools. So we as a team came up with an immediate response after several weeks of the lockdown because we were all in shock but however we realized that we had to make emergency steps to ensure that our children received the necessary interventions and care so we have a computerized database we access the database and we allocated children randomly to our clinicians. We posted social media messages requesting families to contact us. So none of us were trained in providing telehealth. So we had to do online searches and undergo training. We did this at times as groups. We went on national television as a team and appealed to the public and informed the families by how they need to continue their interventions and activities at home. We offered many webinars to our families and also to our colleagues in other centers. So we had multiple strengths as a center because we had a database then subsequently when we could travel to work though the families could not come we had laptops and tabs at our center uh, we got staff transport to the hospital so that we could provide more organized telehealth services to families however our families had many difficulties because they did not have access to um, phones or smartphones or internet um, we could not contact some of them and we were not formally trained in telehealth. So we provided telehealth through synchronous, asynchronous and hybrid methods. This is just an example where a family sends us a video through a WhatsApp message and we um, give them uh, advices through a chat. Uh, more details will be discussed by the uh, speakers lined up and we had excellent outcomes in terms of delivering services which were uninterrupted for many families we also became competent clinicians in telehealth with time and we also could commence student and other clinical teaching we have yielded some other excellent um, benefits in terms of innovative research, intervention approaches, and also as telehealth becoming a regular management option in our new normal. So we are very glad to share our experiences with you and thank you. So um, as uh, Professor Saman Mili um, shared uh, the experience of establishing telehealth practices at IIT, uh, we are going to talk about a feasibility study that was conducted to uh, look at the effectiveness of telehealth. Um, so we have uh, Ms. Bhagya Devagiri next in line um, to um, show, um, share her uh, experience about the research uh, to investigate the effectiveness of telehealth practice. Um, so let's move on to her presentation now. Good 
Good afternoon, all of you. I will be presenting you about how IIT adapt telehealth in managing children with disabilities. The study was conducted during the first COVID wave as an introductory study. First of all, we gathered list of candidates through our electronic records. We selected families who visited IIT from August 2019 till March 2020. A basic data collection sheet was designed and cross-referral pathways were defined. We used a hybrid approach of telehealth, including both asynchronous and synchronous telehealth approaches. For synchronous method, we used telephone conversations initially and moved to social media like WhatsApp, Viber, Emo, and Zoom. For asynchronous telehealth, the families were asked to share a recorded video of recommended activities by their relevant therapist via the social media platforms introduced. Groups were created among MDT members together with the families to optimize the service input they receive. However, using social media is not the safest method to share information and videos, and the parents were thoroughly explained about the risk and the cyber threats. Only the consented families were shared the videos with the team. Data was analyzed descriptively and the parent satisfaction was assessed using telehealth satisfaction scale in terms of technical quality of the video, whole person care, interpersonal communication, and respectfulness while conducting telehealth intervention. Now, let's move to the figures and the numbers. A total of 1,256 families were initially contacted through telephone. 944, which was 75% of the families, were responded to the introduced telehealth service. This graph indicates the breakdown of the conditions of the disabilities of families initially responded to the service. However, the majority falls under the conditions not specified because when the telehealth services initially started, the clinicians had no means to access our own data system. Since there was a lockdown and the parents were also unaware about the child's medical diagnosis. Parents were satisfied with the service we provide and 79% of the families rated us as good service providers. However, in a detailed semi-structured interview conducted, the followings were identified as barriers to the introduced service. Having poor signal coverage and interruptions of sessions due to live calls was challenges. Not having face-to-face -face intervention and having almost zero knowledge about the intervention methods introduced was considered a barrier. Also, parents were not satisfied with the late feedbacks provided for the videos they shared. So, as a conclusion, the telehealth service adopted and implemented at IIT via social media platforms captured intended clients, providing clinicians to explore the natural environment of each client. And I would say it is a mirror for the clinician to reflect on how the families uses recommended intervention strategies in their home environment. It is a meaningful challenge to deliver the service with majority of positive attitudes towards it and a few drawbacks, obviously. As a lesson learned through the service and the study, now at IIT, we have a well-organized, well-managed telehealth service providing telehealth, regular telehealth intervention to children in need. Thank you. All right, so um, hereafter we are going to present some research data and clinical experience from specific um, clinical settings at IIT. Um, and in the next uh, brief presentation, uh, Dr. Thilini Lokubala Surya will elaborate on how learning support services were provided during the pandemic. 
Good afternoon. I'll be talking about the learning support services we provide at IIT. Uh, the majority of clients registered at IIT are having learning problems because almost all children with disabilities are experiencing some kind of learning niche problems. Um, Therefore, we are conducting both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth session throughout this pandemic period. Um, approximately 150 to 200 telehealth learning support sessions per month uh, we are conducting for this client population as both individual or group sessions. Uh, further, uh, if there's a need, uh, multidisciplinary team members also involving with these sessions based on the need and also we provide uh, clinical teaching for undergraduate speech and language therapy students uh, via telehealth as well so let me show you some example of the telehealth sessions uh, we conducted uh, and this is one example of the synchronous telehealth uh, learning assessment as you all can see in this picture uh, we were able to make some accommodations according to the child's need uh, this is also an example of the synchronous telehealth learning assessment. Um, here you can see there is a speech and language therapist also participating for this session. So it's a MDT involvement. Um, this is an example of the learning intervention. As you all can see, we were able to make some color codes, uh, different font sizes according to the requirement of the child. Uh, this is also an intervention session, synchronous intervention session we conducted with the child who are having corticovisual impairment. So as you all can see, it was easy for us to make accommodations, the color contrast based on the requirement of the child. So not only the asynchronous tele, uh, asynchronous telehealth sessions, we conducted asynchronous telehealth sessions as well. So the first example, first screenshots is shown here uh, is an example of the videos or the photographs sent by the parents based on the activities we were providing for the child. So it's basically about outcome measurement. So these two example, um, these are, uh, you, as you can see, the multidisciplinary team members are involving with this video chat. So the several professionals are commenting on the videos sent by mother. Even the audio clips were sent uh, as uh, feedback for this video clips. So like that, we were conducting both synchronous and asynchronous telehealth sessions for our kids who are having academic uh, problems. Um, so there are so many advantages of having telehealth learning sessions because children are learning in the familiar environment so there are no uh, neglection no self-isolation because the family members are supporting for their learning activities and it was very uh, comfortable in environment for them to study so that to, uh, that is a very good uh, positive of uh, telehealth uh, learning sessions as well as for us it's easy to use multi-sensory teaching learning activities we were able to use audio clips uh, video clips and different different animations when we are using activities uh, conducting sessions via screen um, so because we were able to maintain a very good telehealth sessions and telehealth services with our clients, so uninterrupted clinical service as well as uninterrupted student, student teaching uh, uh, is, were conducted uh, during this period. However, there, were there are some disadvantages also. Uh, except the common usual difficulties such as poor connectivity and uh, the technical problems uh, if the children are having attention problems so maintaining attention for a screen is a difficult task for them so it was uh, difficult for us to do uh, proper sessions in that situation as well as if the parents are not sending us uh, out uh, the videos as we requested outcome monitoring also uh, a little difficult 
and uh, even though we were able to conduct group intervention sessions and individual intervention sessions, so the one-to-one -one interaction and peer group interactions are limited when we are conducting uh, telehealth sessions. However, as a team, we are so happy and we are so proud because we were able to conduct and we are still conducting a very good uh, we, uh, telehealth services uh, for our kids who are having academic needs. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the next uh, specific clinic we are going to discuss is the uh, feed-in support clinic at IIT. Um, as uh, Ms. Kamini and Dr. Miles mentioned in their presentations about the risk of uh, uh, having uh, swallowing assessments and swallowing intervention during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, because of the nature of aerosol generation during the oropharyngeal examination um, and uh, swallowing assessment, um, it is considered a high-risk clinical task during this pandemic. So at the feed-in support clinic, we had to look at how we are going to um, provide uh, necessary services in, uh, in different alternative manners. So um, as, a, as a result, we have developed a criteria for prioritizing children at the clinic and developed a care pathway by following um, the guidelines provided by organizations such as um, the Dysphagia Research Society, um, American Speech Language and Hearing Association, the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists in the UK and uh, Speech Pathology Australia. At IIT, a pre-screening for symptoms or risk factors associated with COVID-19 is done by the front desk team before scheduling in-person appointments. During the lockdowns, a virtual swallow screening was offered to all newly referred kids using standard tools such as um, the pediatric version of the E10 and newly developed tool um, such as Q15. We will hear more about the Q15 um, tool in a few minutes. After a swallow screening, which was done virtually, a video-based mealtime observations were done via WhatsApp or Zoom. And the same platform was used to provide recommendations, suggestions, and helpful tips to the parents and families so they feel empowered to work with their child without letting them feel isolated. And the care pathway we developed included um, identifying the level of functional oral skills of the child and, to, and considering the level of severity children were offered virtual or in-person sessions. And when required, instrumental swallowing assessments were conducted in collaboration with the Lady Ridgeway Hospital for Children in Colombo. But I have to um, emphasize that video fluoroscopy was not conducted during the pandemic. It was the flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. That was also um, only for children who was having uh, urgent need for an, um, uh, for an instrumental assessment. Um, now um, we are going to hear from Ms. Asha about uh, a study they did to develop a new swallow screening tool uh, which is known as Q15. Good afternoon everyone. I will be presenting about the results uh, of an audit conducted at Fading Clinic of IIT Center. Moving on to the introduction. As you already know, one of the biggest challenges that the feeding therapy field faced during COVID-19 was that identifying children who need face-to-face -face therapy and telehealth services. Thus, as the initial step, we administered an existing parent report screening questionnaire known as PEDI-EAT to identify the client priority need to be given for the face-to-face -face feeding therapy. But this assessment was time consuming since it had 78 questions and it was conducted over the telephone due to COVID-19. This led us developing a new short form of a screening questionnaire that is Pediatric Dysphagia Q15 questionnaire, which is also parent report one. This questionnaire had 15 questions, including 13 yes-no questions and two questions including with Likert scales. 
These two questions were not uh, considered in the client prioritization process since uh, the parents uh, didn't always identify their children's feeding difficulty as a priority when compared to the other needs. And the question number 13, which was about the child's meal time duration, was also not considered in the client prioritization process since uh, in Sri Lanka, the children's meal time uh, take uh, usually longer. But the other questions were included in the client prioritization for the face-to-face -face therapy. Thus, the objective of this study was to identify whether this questionnaire can really be used as an instrument to identify the client priority need to be given for the face-to-face -face therapy. So, this uh, carefully constructed Q15 questionnaire were administered at the first visit of IIT Center from May to August of 2020. There, we could be able to detect that some children were presenting with feeding issues. Their screening questionnaires were further analyzed in order to identify what kind of priority need to be given for that particular client. So if a child has scored any single score for the question starting from five to 11 were considered as a high risk of uh, having aspiration, thus need to be given high priority for the face-to-face -face therapy. The other group of children were referred to the telehealth services. Finally, we compared whether the clean, uh, priority given by the clinician is the same priority indicated in the Q15 questionnaire. Let's talk about the result. So 90% of the children who were uh, given high priority in the Q15 questionnaire were given high priority by the clinician also. But 10% of the children were not given high priority by the clinician. Why is that? One of the reasons is some children cannot be recommended uh, for direct face-to-face -face consultation um, by telehealth consultation, as this group of children were identified as a uh, high risk of COVID-19, and clinician has decided to offer telehealth sessions due to potential benefits of observing that child in a natural setting. Let's talk about the other section. So 95% of the children who were uh, given low priority in the Q15 questionnaire were given low priority by the clinician also. But 5% of the children were given high priority by the clinician, uh, mainly due to significant concerns uh, regarding the weight gain uh, and or sensory issues impacting meal times of those kids. Thus, the clinician had to decide to offer a direct face-to-face -face consultation with MDT colleagues. So, uh, the results indicate that the agreement in between the clinician's recommendation and the Q15 results at a high level of percentage. It indicates that this uh, questionnaire can be used as an instrument uh, to identify the client priority for the face-to-face -face feeding therapy. Thank you. Um, before moving to the um, next um, uh, clinic, uh, we are going to share some of the uh, reflections that we have gathered from our colleagues who are contributing to the uh, feeding support clinic. So um, it's very evident that limited access for physical examination of head and neck area and uh, bedside evaluation uh, during telehealth is challenging when providing intervention. However, being able to observe children at their natural feeding environments and how parents are conducting the recommended exercises and activities at home were clinically beneficial. So we are coming to the um, very last recorded presentation of this session. Um, this presentation um, is done by Ms. Tanuja and Mr. Amila, discusses uh, music therapy and interesting clinical approach around the world. Uh, which is an integrated multidisciplinary approach. Here we share how it was used by a multidisciplinary team at IIT. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Highland Studies, What Music Therapy Approach, a collaborative work of the Department of Disability Studies at the National Center for Children with Disabilities and the Cultural Center Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalanin. According to Hans Christian Andersen, where words where music speaks. Music and movement have been used successfully with a range of children, for an example, with the children with autism spectrum disorders and adolescents with learning disabilities. So as we all know, 
Music is fun and motivating, which contributes the, to the social development and rehabilitation by supporting integrated teamwork with the other practitioners for providing a holistic and transcendent approach in clinical services. So this is our objective to explore the feasibility of a multidisciplinary eight-week music-based intervention program for the children who need special language therapy, physiotherapy, and occupational therapy. The rationale behind is that an integrated therapy approach which encourages the interprofessional collaboration and holistic plant-centered intervention promoting activate participation. After uh, identifying the possible groups of the clients, we took the baseline measurements of the clients to identify the speech therapy, physiotherapy, and occupation therapy camps. So these are the selected groups of the clients, the children with autism spectrum disorder, trisomy 21, cerebral palsy, age range between 1 year to 6 years. So after that, we prepare the activities for the block of therapy sessions using the music and offer the joint sessions. The parents were expected to send the video recordings in the first, fifth and eighth week sessions, including the activities we have introduced during the sessions to measure the progress. So these are some of the broad target areas in the spot music sessions. The special language therapy aims are the attention and listening skills, communicating intent, initiation, requesting, choice making, waiting and turn taking, receptive and expressive language, including single words to complex sentences, expressive communication, including speech, sign and gestures, augmentative and alternative communication. We had one client who used our WhatsApp. So the rest of the raw target areas and the presentation will continue by Mr. Amin. In DTA, the targeted aims and targeted areas were active motor learning, motor playing, survey and return, upper limb choosing skills, positioning strategies, skills in positional changes to the request and demonstrations, static and dynamic standing and sitting balance, strength, endurance, agility and flexibility, active, active participation of the family. In OTN, balance and coordination, by manual hand skills, fine motor skills and social interaction and participation. These are some of the resources we use uh, in our sessions, picture cards and musical instruments. So we, at the end of the each session, we give the feedback from the parents and we got feedback from parents. So these are some of the feedbacks we got from music groups. He improved a lot. The music sessions really helped a lot in my child's progression. We did not have electricity to join the sessions, likewise. During the sessions, we introduced parents to the new activities. So there was a direct parent involvement in the activities. So we were there to facilitate and train the parents. They self-motivated and encouraged to learn from each other, like positioning strategies and use of introduced strategies. They tend to share their experiences in creativity, in new ideas and new materials and so on choices. So at the end of the each session, we provided individual feedback. So we gave them activities how, and taught them how to integratedly achieve those aims and goals. At the end of the program, we offered a home-based program and asked to send videos. At the end of the each session, in next session, we provided feedback for them. And we faced many challenges during the sessions. One of the main challenges was the bad connectivity. And the second thing was the uh, background noises from the family background. These are some snapshots we taken during our sessions. This is the ongoing program. program. Thank you. Okay, so to conclude the session, uh, we would like to reflect on um, some of the clinical and research experience we briefly shared with you. Even though COVID-19 has uh, been a real challenge for all of us in different ways, it certainly allowed us to think out of the box in offering clinical services to children with disabilities. 
these novel and innovative strategies and techniques should be continued to maximize the benefit they offer. And most importantly, the method should be productive and sustainable in the long run. As healthcare educators, we cannot ignore the importance of training the future clinicians and the pandemic should not be taken as an obstacle to offer training in different modes. Finally, the key is to empower parents and families of children with disabilities so they are motivated and encouraged to move forward in this journey together. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, all the clinicians at IATI um, who have been uh, working tirelessly during this pandemic to uh, look at alternatives to continue our services and um, all the uh, clinicians from the Ministry of Health who have been inspirational in um, has shown wonderful commitment to work and not only the clinician but also uh, other members in the administrative and maintenance um, sections uh, who are helping us for the daily running of IATI during lockdowns and um, during this challenging time. So thank you so much for your uh, support and contribution. Even though it was a very few of us uh, today present in um, here at this symposium and a very little uh, of what we have been doing at IATI, uh, thank you so much for your uh, contribution and thank you so much for the organizing committee and the web coordinator team for accommodating the uh, accommodating this different format of our presentation and uh, thank you so much for your time uh, for listening uh, to this session you can find latest updates and news about our clinical and research work using the links displayed here thank you so much have a good evening Thank you so very much to um, Dr. Isuru and um, the team presenting. As Isuru said, it's on behalf of all of our colleagues. I think it was a really lovely, inclusive presentation in, in the spirit of um, uh, the MDT work. And it was a snapshot of the clinics that, you, uh, that we undertake. Um, and it's really lovely to see that even here in the global south where we have minimal resources we have still been able to offer uh, telehealth in its um, in its different formats and continue to offer all of our clinics i know we started a little uh, late so we have a few questions and it would be lovely if we could just manage to get um, those questions answered. Um, my, the first question is really to, uh, doc, um, is to Ms. Um, Kamini. Um, hi Kamini, how lovely to see you. Lovely to see you as well. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, Kamini. So the first question is really, um, uh, connected to the comment that you made about digital poverty and digital, digital literacy issues. And um, the question is whether you are seeing any type of pattern in terms of a particular community that is getting excluded from uh, telehealth services. Well, we've been doing a survey with members uh, to find out from them who who's particularly affected. I think it's... Uh, um, parents and families who are living mostly in poverty that are most affected, as well as um, people with communication difficulties, um, which result in the fact that actually accessing care through telehealth has become, is, is more difficult for them. Um, so the digital poverty is mostly uh, with relation to people who are, themselves are from um, more deprived and socioeconomically deprived areas. Thank you, Kamini. Um, there's a question for both Kamini as, um, as well as to Dr. Anna, um, and it really is a reflection on um, the fact that we offer clinical teaching at, at our um, hands-on clinicals as part of the course. Um, so there are two questions, and they're interconnected. Um, so it's to ask whether um, the changes to about the changes to guidelines of student clinical work um, in terms of um, 
whether there was a change in the number of direct hands-on uh, practice hours that are now um, expected in terms of qualifying to practice. Um, and a question, a similar question from Dr. Nimisha um, to both speakers. How do you find a balance between providing a, a student adequate clinical exposure that is not just limited to telehealth and while keeping them safe during, um, during this, this time? So, Kamini, maybe over to you first and then uh, Dr. Anna, please. I think there's been a mixed approach uh, for students. So some students have been having face-to-face -face placements and uh, with appropriate um, RPE and PP being provided, they've been able to have that opportunity to work with patients. Uh, for some students, you're right, they haven't had as much experience and we're already hearing that newly qualified therapists are less confident. So we're working to look at how we support newly qualified therapists to really build some of their confidence clinically. And we're working with our members on um, a whole range of new innovations. So that's something that I, I can come back to you on when we see how we get on with those ideas. Um, I think one of them is around having a virtual surgeries uh, and using other opportunities to support newly qualified therapists. We did have a presentation at our conference from a student who talked about how um, they used new ways of working to try and help support students to learn differently. But you're right, this is an ongoing challenge that we need to just, I guess, work together on. None of us have faced a pandemic like this before. So working to find solutions together and sharing those ideas is something we'll continue to do. Thank you, Kamini. We, we would look forward to uh, learning from your experience because we, we are experiencing obviously the, the same. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Anna is not with us at the moment, but I do want to read another question that is for uh, Dr. Anna and perhaps uh, with Dr. Isuru's support, we can send the questions to uh, Dr. Anna to get a response in, in due course. This is a question from um, from Dr. Dinushi, a lot of your COVID swallowing management involves instrumental investigations. How best could a clinician in a developing country um, with less access to instrumentation investigate and manage swallowing difficulties during the acute stage of COVID-19? So we, we promise to send this, quest, this question along to Dr. Anna and, and get a response. Um, just wanted to finally ask you, um, Kamini, whether you had any advice for us here as we grapple with the same issue of um, collecting um, research data to inform policy and to push for changes in, in policy, and particularly for us in terms of um, pushing to get people with disabilities included in those conversations. And I wondered whether you had any advice for us from the work that you've been doing. Okay, Shamli. So I think it's been really important that we uh, lobby and we advocate on behalf of our service users. So we have been writing to government. We've worked very closely with service user organizations. I'm very happy to share the letters that we sent to the prime minister uh, on behalf of a coalition of partners um, to push for uh, ongoing support for those people with disability, and that includes both children and adults. So you can see how you may repurpose some of that, um, uh, the, some of that information or some of the narrative that we've used in the letters. We very much use the um, work or the policy direction from this government in, uh, in, in, in the UK, which is around building back better, as, as the, the tagline to say, okay, we want to build back better and we want to build back better for people with disability and those with communication difficulties. So very happy to share that with you. We've also been working very closely with service user organisations, again, to just identify the ongoing challenges for our service user group. So anything that we've done, uh, as I said, whether it's surveys or whether it's letters, um, I'm happy to share. We're very fortunate that we do have a policy and public affairs um, team at the RCSLT. So uh, if there's anything else we can do, just let me know. 
As always, thanks ever so much, uh, Kamini, uh, particularly for your generosity in, in sharing um, your research and all of your work to, to support our work here in, in the Global South. Um, there was one other question for Dr. Anna, which was, how do you overcome essential aspects of a dysphagia assessment, such as cough, in, in the current COVID context? So we promise to send that question along as well. And we have a couple of questions for um, our local experts. Um, I know that Dr. Samanwadi is joining us um, on, on, online. And so maybe, uh, Samanwadi, you could start off uh, the response to this question and, and then to, to the team who's, who's here. The question is about any um, aspects that you hope to continue, that you learn from telehealth, that you hope to continue even when, even in direct face-to-face -face, um, sessions. So, is there anything that you, um, that you, the team particularly found useful that maybe even surprised you um, that you think you are now going to include as an essential part of uh, assessment and therapy, even in our live sessions? So, over to you, uh, Professor Zamanmili. Good afternoon, Shan, and uh, thank you so much, everybody, for listening and uh, joining us. Uh, I hope I'm clear and you can hear me. Um, I think uh, I can speak on behalf of uh, uh, certain aspects, but I'm sure the other colleagues have a lot more to share. Uh, the most important thing I would like to uh, mention is that uh, we were able to see um, the home environment and the facilities uh, within the home and how families coped uh, with the instructions that we have given them. Also, um, we have been using um, telehealth practices over a long time to observe things like uh, seizures um, when children are at home. So I think that is also something that we will continue to do so because families were able to show us some specific behaviors that children uh, manifest during um, within the home environment, which we would not see within the clinics. Uh, as I said previously, the most important thing was the physical and the social environment within the home that we could observe. And we hope to continue doing uh, uh, telehealth for all children attending IT, even in a, like in a regular manner, but maybe in a, more spaced out way because uh, that gives us very valuable information um, to manage these children on the long run. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Saman Mali. Anybody else from the team, um, if you'd like to add some of your reflections, please? Can you all hear me? Yeah, properly. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, learning support, so as we everyone know, like when uh, children are learning at the home environment, how the parents are supporting for these children, we will be able to observe through the uh, telehealth session through the screen. So as I mentioned in my presentation as well, like. For the CVI, the kids with corticovisual impairments and the kids who are having uh, difficulties uh, with the accurate, le the, le the font sizes of the textbooks. Uh, so we are able to use uh, the screens and kind of uh, those adaptations that we use as telehealth, uh, through the telehealth me method throughout the uh, uh, the period as well. Uh, so, so we are hoping to continue those services for the kids who are having 
uh, such kind of needs. So we are helping them with the computers and we are helping them with the large keyboard facilities um, uh, to uh, support their reading and writing skills. So I hope we will be able to continue this service throughout the, uh, the period and uh, throughout uh, the next few years as well. Wonderful. Any, any other um, colleagues to add to uh, Thirini's reflections? Op, op. Yes, please, Isuru. Um, yeah, so um, I'll just um, have a little um, suggestion about uh, how we are conducting uh, early intervention clinic um, at IIT um, because um, in the format of the clinic, we usually uh, get the parents and the kid to the clinic, um, like not very frequently, but once a month. And then we train the parents on how to stimulate communication development and um, uh, get the child to interact and play um, in the home setting. And in this, um, before COVID, uh, there was no use of uh, WhatsApp groups or something like that. Uh, in the format of uh, reviewing or measuring outcomes of parent training. So, but because of the COVID, we were able to get the parents and clinicians involved in WhatsApp groups. Because of that, we are able to see how they are doing the activities at home and the clinicians can, as Professor Saman Mali uh, mentioned in her presentation, and the clinicians can provide feedback to the activities. And I think um, even after the lockdown, at the moment also we are continuing the same groups because we can, uh, while we are not reviewing them, like um, while when we are not getting them to the clinic, we can still continue the group where we can provide feedback and monitor the um, progress of children. Thank you. So I hope that will be continuing. Thank you so much. And we're just going to squeeze in one last question, if we possibly can, please. Uh, and, it, and that's just some reflections on, um, on how to overcome some of the challenges that you all talked about in your presentation. In, any thoughts on how we can increase access? Uh, Saman Mali, maybe if we can start with you, if at all possible. Yeah. We have been exploring to see whether we could get some uh, telecommunication um, companies to collaborate with IT. It's not only IT, I think we have to look at expanding telehealth services uh, to all other centers also, which are. Um, in Sri Lanka as much as possible. So it has to be a more kind of a national initiative to see whether we could, I mean, that has to be the long run, um, one of the approaches. And uh, we have to look at some kind of collaborations. But I think uh, talking on behalf of Minisha and her AEC lab, uh, we have been loaning AECs uh, to families and uh, uh, we are using uh, the loan AACs also at the moment uh, to connect with the families, so that is a nice method we are doing. Um, in the ex sharing experiences with the families uh, during the COVID, um, there were so many instances where the relatives, friends, they came in to assist the families to provide uh, modes of communication and there were situations where sometimes I had to do telehealth where the family has visited another relative who could uh, assist them with the um, uh, device. So yeah, those are the local inventions but we had to look at a more national collaborative kind of a project. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Saman Mali and the team. Um, so to conclude, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the faculty as well as my department to thank our eminent speakers today. Thanks ever so much 
um, to Ms. Kamini Gadok, MBE, from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, joining us from the UK, and to Dr. Anna Miles, joining us from New Zealand, as well as to the DDS and IAT team for your presentations. It's, it's been a wonderful experience of um, thinking about um, how services have changed both in the global north as well as here in the global south and how much we have in common even though we are an under-resourced country and how in the future there are so many opportunities to learn from each other and to collaborate. And as we go along, um, it is also an invitation for us all to think about how we offer services to as many uh, children as, and adults as possible so that no one gets left behind. So thank you very much for joining us and stay safe. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you. Api kaget kemetta suasai jiwa tenai. Kau ru dan melista samuhe sabima pada nama nisa melista hospital seragam meteram suwisheshi. Ihelam pramiti sahati kawalin pidum labla tien ne seva wan ke guna atma kawal nisa. Pena wan ke hari itu jiwa te alu tin patang kat tawage. E api kawal nisa e tarang kari adum piriwekin seva wan laba dene. हेमदामत अपे सबंधिया भी बोलते ना भाई बेल स्टार हॉस्पिटल्स प्रागमा सुवात सविमात सबंधिया वक एस्टैब्लिश्ड इन 1954 फरो सन्स लैबोरेटरीज लिमिटेड्स फार्मास्यूटिकल मैन्युफैक्चरिंग प्लांट इन नोशेरा इंडस्ट्रियल एस्टेट केपीके वाज वन ऑफ़ द फर्स्ट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग फैसिलिटीज � over the last six decades, the plant has undergone multiple expansions and is today one of the most modern production facilities in the country. The Ferro Sons Manufacturing Facility is spread over 30 acres of land with a total annual capacity of over 900 million tablets and capsules and about 20 million syrups, sachets and other pharmaceutical formulations. Designed according to the international principles of pharmaceutical production, the Ferro Sons Laboratories Noshera facility is fully CGMP compliant. People trust us. Thank you for putting your trust in Ferro Sons. Suasai jiwa tenai. Kau ru dan melista samuhe sabima pada nama nisa melista hospital seragam meteram suwisheshi. Ihelam pramiti sahati kawalin pidum labla tien ne seva wan ke guna atma kawal nisa. Pena wan ke 